Hi, I'm Rich Straffolino, one of the reporters for Cybersecurity Headlines. It's a news podcast that delivers the most important cybersecurity stories every weekday in about six minutes. Subscribe through your favorite podcast app or at CISOseries.com. 10 second security tip go! Compliance is measured using pass fail grades. As such, when organizations face a pass fail criteria, they default to the absolute minimum necessary to pass. Security is measured in risk levels, or more specifically, the likelihood of harm and the impact to business value or human lives. When you approach security from a risk perspective, you cannot afford just to pass. You must aspire to achieve A+. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Joining me as always is my co-host, Mike Johnson. Mike, speak up. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Our no, mic check. That, that's what no, you do at the beginning the of the check. show oh, for gosh. our audio test. I always forget. They want to hear something more interesting <laughs> from you. We're available at CISOseries.com. We're available on the subreddit, CISO Series. We are also, every Friday, we do a wonderful, super fun video chat. This Friday, which would be January 22nd, 2021, our topic is hacking high-profile accounts. This should be a fun discussion. And also, if you haven't subscribed to the Cybersecurity Headlines, please do that. It's a lot of fun. Six minutes. We're not fun. It's informative. Let me say it that way. The video chat's fun. The headlines are informative. Six minutes, you get your news every day. Our sponsor for today's episode is StackRox. If you're using Kubernetes, you're going to want to listen to this. More about StackRox later in the show. Mike, we record our episodes like often a couple of weeks, minimum a week before. You're giving the secret away. I know we're giving a secret. <laughs> The problem is I usually tend to shy away from doing highly timely news. And I realize we've done many episodes where we have not mentioned solar winds <laughs> at all. So I'm wondering if all our listeners go, hey, do these guys know that this big hack happened? We did notice. And it's kind of a big deal? Yeah. We do know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of been this gorilla in this in the corner of my room that's continued to grow episode after episode <laughs> when we've not talked about it it's just it's I just know. been staring at me that yes well, we we are we are definitely aware and we uh we, we know i'm gonna figure a way to bring it in that if we talk about it a few weeks ahead of time and some other news comes out we don't look like complete idiots and morons <laughs> that's more my fear is i don't want to look at us look like complete idiots and morons which or more than we already look Yes, we we we're really good at doing that by ourselves. Yes, yes. we don't we don't need the help from news uh, if from the future. All right, our guest who we've had on a few times before and excited to have him on again is Jerome Levy, who is the former CISO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City. Jerome, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you, Mike. So glad to be here. Is this a cybersecurity disinformation campaign? On Reddit, an explosive discussion formed around a ComputerWeekly.com article by Saj Hook of Plexal about the importance of making disinformation a security issue. Now, the problem, though, has primarily fell into the hands of social media companies, mostly because that's where disinformation spreads. Now, while we've seen disinformation being used as a political tool, for businesses, it can tarnish your corporate brand, consumer trust, and ultimately the value of your product. It's also used in phishing campaigns. Breaches are compromising your data. Disinformation is questioning the validity and value of data without even stealing it. Mike, you first. How do you combat that? I mean, this is the big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this was an interesting article, and I was really surprised. There was like two thousand comments or responses on Reddit to this. It was it was really surprising. I think what a lot of people were looking at though was they were looking at the national security implications of disinformation and some of you know how does this affect companies? It's for the governments to figure out how to deal with that threat. In terms of our companies. I'm not sure that disinformation is a security issue. Well, that's the argument here that Saj puts out. So I disagree with that. 
that at, at a company level, marketing teams have been dealing with managing the brand of the company for eons. That's their job. Those brands can be impacted for multiple reasons. It could be bad product experience, bad product release, uh, company or employee behavior. There's any number of impacts that can happen. But what about just good old fashioned competition or fake, you know, like what we see in the political sphere is just, you know, these sort of fake accounts get created to just essentially spread information, creating these sort of faux newspaper websites that looks like it's legitimate when it's all bogus. Yeah. And those are like intentional brand damage, right? right. And, and that, I mean, don't companies run into this nonsense as well? Absolutely. I think they've been dealing with it for a long time. And I think companies know how to manage this. They may not be bringing all of the resources that they have to bear. And I'm more than happy to help out our marketing team on those situations and, and lend my experience. But I don't see it as a cybersecurity concern. I see this as brand management concern that has some cybersecurity impacts to it. All right. Your own, obviously, Mike is passing the buck. That's what he likes to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Is it is it truly just a brand management concern or does, as the author of this article say, and, and by the way, I don't believe he specifically calls out companies, but he just says that this disinformation is a cybersecurity issue. Do you believe this is a cybersecurity issue that you have to get more involved in? Well, I I agree with Mike, but I also somewhat disagree. And, and, and I know it's kind of interesting to say that, but when I think about this information, when I think about it more as a psychological warfare, whether it's like, you know, in a national level or in a business level, you're targeting the integrity of the organization. And Integrity is one of the core tenets of security. So I think what we need to recognize is that in this day and age and in this digital age or this digital economy, I think, yes, this has been always there, but now it's actually easier to deploy. It's easier to create. It's running much, much faster. And because of that, I think it's becoming a bigger cybersecurity threat compared to where it was in the past. In the past, I mean, if you wanted to, you know, put an ad in the newspaper, uh, you had to spend money and you had to know the auditor and you had to convince the newspaper to do it, you know, and so on and so forth. And then you also risk a defamation lawsuit or whatever. Here, anybody with a keyboard can just go on Twitter and spew whatever they want. And how do you combat it? How do you defend against that? So I do think it's becoming a cybersecurity issue. Are we having communication issues? Now, we're recording this episode shortly after GoDaddy sent its infamous phishing test email that promised employees a $650 bonus check. When I saw this, I thought of you, Mike, about how much you hate, <laughs> essentially, it's what it is, is mocking employees to a certain degree yep. with these phishing tests. But anyways, those who clicked on the email were rewarded with additional security training, not the Yay. $650 bonus check. It took the entire internet to point out how insensitive this was. Now, GoDaddy's response was, quote, we understand some employees were upset by the phishing attempt and felt it was insensitive, for which we have apologized. I don't know about that apology. They argued that while it may be insensitive, these types of well-timed phishing emails do happen. Mike, I know you don't like phishing tests and your own. I know you've proven that if creative enough, anyone can fall for a fish. So, how can the company and security be more sensitive to employees, respect them, while also letting them know they may receive a malicious email just like the one GoDaddy sent your own? Yeah, I got so mad when I saw that. I mean, I, I think, you know, we need to stop treating employees as, as the problem and start thinking about them as the solution. And, and I'm going to put that in a little bit of a different perspective just to highlight how absurd it is, like the, you know, the approach that most companies take. So I grew up in Israel. And I grew up in a time where the threat of terrorists planting bombs in various locations was pretty high. And bombs were hidden in like envelopes, packages, you know, bags, loaf of bread, I mean, you name it. I remember that since kindergarten, we were taught to look around, to be vigilant, to look at things that if they're out of place and then notify somebody and notify the police, don't alert like an adult or something like that. There were posters everywhere. I mean, it was something that was communicated constantly. That's how we build that muscle, if you will, and build that vigilant that's still with me until this day. I mean, the bomb squad never took and just kind of planted bombs to see who's going to be the idiot who's <laughs> just going to touch it and just going to blow up with it and then, you know, kind of point at them, right? I think in a way we need to kind of think about phishing campaigns kind of the same way. We don't need to fail our employees. It doesn't serve any, any purpose. It doesn't buy anything. 
if anything, let them know that you're sending something and tell them exactly what to look for. And this is how we are going to train the muscle and empower them to do it. Stop treating them like idiots. Good point. I like that uh, whole concept of training the muscle. Mike, how do you train the muscle? So first, I, I did want to react to the apology. Yeah, the apology was pretty lame. I mean, it was basically the, I'm sorry that you were offended kind of yeah, policy. I hate th that's my least favorite. It's not an apology. I'm sorry that what I said offended you. Yes. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I just, so I, I just couldn't let You're that a go. jackass. I'm sorry that what I just said <laughs> offended you. <laughs> uh, so... I think in, in terms of how do we help our employees, I, what you said, David, in your in your question, I think is really important to to concentrate on. It's we don't need to turn our employees into perfect fish detectors. We need them to be aware that there are malicious emails that are going to come to them. That these emails are going to arrive in their inbox. It's the education that we need to be giving, not testing to make sure that can I make a better fish that they can't see. They're not going to get, and then so I'm going to get them because I made a better fish and I fooled them. We need to be giving them, these are the indicators that you should look for. These are the types of things that you should look for. We need to tell them what to do with them. With that, they'll get to a point where they're going to be able to identify most of the fishes. But to expect them to identify everyone, every time, it's just too high of a bar. Yaron made a, a good point in previous discussions that there's always going to be a better fish. There's always going to be something that you're going to be able to get by somebody. So I really think we need to revisit what we're doing here. This is education. This isn't trying to get somebody. And that's what we really need to come back to is what we're trying to do here is to give people the tools to help and not to try and make them angry or, or, or make them feel like we got them. When it comes to container and Kubernetes security, there is both an advantage and a pressing need to protect cloud-native apps across their full lifecycle by shifting focus from the container and onto techniques that better address the new culture of everything as code. Steve Jaguer is Director of Solutions and Community at StackRox. Well, we're in the middle of some form of digital transformation, but specifically the transformation into cloud creates a lot of uncertainty and it creates a new attack surface. Now there's a lot of solutions out there in open source for specifically Kubernetes security, container security. But I think what is good for CISOs specifically to know is that as we move toward a concept of everything as code, we have a new advantage. And that is that as applications are developed and dependencies are packaged with those into containers, all of that is done as code. And we have the opportunity to check for vulnerabilities at this stage. But what is a larger advantage is that as we push things into Kubernetes specifically, we package them into declarative definitions called deployments or pods, et cetera, that gives us an idea of how our pieces of that microservice application will be used. It gives us additional context that both prior to deployment and during deployment can be used to turn the basic indicators of risk like vulnerabilities into a better definition of risk so that we're doing more risk management instead of vulnerability management. For more information, visit Stackrocks, S T A C K R O X dot com. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, I don't need to explain to you, your own, how What's Worse works, but for the audience, I'll just explain. It's a risk management exercise. I'm going to give two scenarios. They both stink. Uh, you have to just decide which of the two is worse than the other. Uh, this comes from Marco Tulio Morais of Red Ventures. And to you first, Mike, your company, which is a bank, will create a subsidiary in Brazil. You are the global CISO. Here are your two scenarios. One, are you going to put someone of your team in the U.S. to be the local Brazil CISO, but that person has no knowledge of Brazilian central bank cybersecurity regulations and data privacy laws, which are known as LGBD, PD, excuse me. Or second option, are you going to hire a local Brazilian experienced CISO that knows very much about the law? However, he has zero knowledge on the topics of cyber projects and initiatives that you need to be deployed globally. Oh, and he doesn't speak English. 
Who, which one's the worst scenario? This is a good one. I like this one. So first of all, uh, he or she, there are more than just he's that can be CISOs out yes, there. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, he or she. So it, it's kind of funny that, that Brazil uh, is the one that, that Marco used in his example. Brazil has unique threats out there. There are entire industries around Brazilian banking malware that's totally unique to Brazil. Years ago, I worked for a company that had a Brazilian factory, and it's its own place. Uh, I think even in like Fast and the Furious, they talk about how Brazil is its own thing. So all this is a way of me saying this is actually an easy one for me. I would 100% hire the, the Brazilian who has the local context. I can teach them the things that I need to get done. If we need to get a translator that can help us communicate with each other, that's an easy. Those are all solvable problems, but teaching someone all of the unique issues of Brazil specifically, it's just going to take years, and they're probably never going to get it right. So this one's easy. Easy for you. The worst one is uh, hiring someone in in the U.S. and having them go to Brazil. All right, Jeroen, do you agree or disagree with that? I, I completely agree with Mike. Yeah, all the other problems are solvable. And I think just in general, I think from a security perspective, you know, we need to evolve into pushing the decisions closer to the edges and closer to where the business is being Good made. Good point. Good point. As opposed to just kind of centralized toll gate that everybody kind of have to go through. So I completely agree with Mike on that one. How do you go about discovering new security solutions? Julia Wool of Evolve Security said, I just finished a Splunk course and wanted to explore other SIM platforms, and I am having a difficult time understanding how an enterprise should choose a vendor in this space. I could not imagine being the guy at an enterprise that has to consider all these different vendors that seem to be doing the same thing. Now, we obviously talk a lot about choosing vendors, but Julia brings up a really good concern. If you were completely green, didn't have CISO connections, and were going to choose a SIM for which there's tons of competition for the very first time, how would you go about determining your needs and then researching and deciding what sources would you use and how do you limit this effort so you're not overwhelmed, which I think could be huge. So I'm going to start with you, Yaron. And let's take it like a, the sim example because it's it's so massive. Where would you begin? Yeah, so I actually lived through a very similar similar scenario when I started here at Blue Cross. So I think the first thing you need to do is to recognize that no matter what, it will never be perfect. So don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of good here. And then second, in this case, I will prioritize speed over quality. So what, what I mean by that is having something even if it's not great or, or even if it's like mediocre, it's, it's better than nothing. So you can opt, I mean, pretty quickly, I mean, to bring a VAR or an MSSP and, and take whatever they have or whatever they can give you, put it in there and start working. And as you start working, you're going to learn what you need. You can fine tune and then down the road, you can actually figure out what's a better solution for you, what works better for you. You're going to have much more experience to make that better decision. You're not completely exposed. You're still going to have something but then you're going to improve it over time. That's pretty much kind of what I did here at the beginning. We didn't have money. So, but let me add to this. What I'm hearing also when you say that is, do not make a multi-year contract <laughs> at the beginning. No, <laughs> that, that's true. I mean, I, I rarely, rarely commit to like a multi-year contract. I usually start with a one year and grow from there. All right, Mike, agree, disagree. What would you <laughs> add to it? So when thinking about this one, I really had a hard time putting myself in the, I have no connections. Because throughout my career, I've always had someone I could ask. Well, but to a degree, I'm just saying that like what I always hear, and the, the reason I'm pausing you here is every time I hear a CISO looking for another solution, they just, oh, I just asked my other CISO right. friends. What are they right. using? But, but kind of my point there that was, though, is you don't have to talk to your CISO friends. If you, you know, talk to somebody you know who has the expertise. And if you don't have that, if you don't have the in-house expertise and you don't have the ability to ask people who you trust – then outsource it. You're not going to do a good job and recognize that you should go talk with somebody that this is their thing. A SIM is an expensive investment. Uh, Splunk, not cheap. And it's possible you don't even need one. And, And so if you talk with, say, a managed detection and response company, 
they're going to not only have the SIM capability, they're going to know what to do with the events. And that'll really help you get the full experience and the full value out of a SIM without necessarily doing it yourself. Now, the, the question then becomes, well, how do you choose an MDR vendor? So not, not to completely dodge the question. And really there, it's you know, document your requirements, document your expectations, document what is special about your environment. And then actually, I'd go to Google. You know, genuinely go to Google, start searching. You'll very quickly find five or six vendors to, to dive into. And then when you talk with them, they're actually going to tell you who their competitors are. And that then helps you build this initial list of, of who to talk to. And you can have those frank conversations. And you can even start asking competitors to tell you about their competitors. And so in, in a way, you're, you're building without, again, knowing anybody outside. You're building this list of knowledge about the various vendors. And what you're going to then be able to get from there is the information that you need to make a decision on who can be your MDR vendor rather than, hey, I need to buy a SIM. Really, the advice here is if you don't have the in-house expertise, don't do it. So let me also add something like this. In terms of finding competitors, there's two great online services, g2.com and owler.com, which unlike using something like a Gartner, which we kind of know they have a limitation and there is sort of a... You know, we don't know who does and doesn't make their lists. It's not, it's all a little cloudy. Those services will show a far more extensive list, often not directly competitive to as well. So if you kind of want to see even more players in the space. But I want to go back to something that Jerome said that I think is very interesting. I remember we did an episode in Defense in Depth on this about the Toyota Camry of security, meaning everyone feels that they need to get the Cadillac. But often... Like what you said before, your own 80 to 90% is pretty good. And it may also cost you 30% of what a Cadillac costs, right? So, I mean, when you go and look at solutions, are you off? Are you would say, well, we got to get the Cadillac SIM? Or are you looking, no, I want to get the Camry that'll get me around? Well, the very first question I'm asking always is like, what problem we are trying to solve? And if I don't know to answer that, I don't even start looking for, for a tool or a solution. Once I understand what problem we're trying to solve, again, even if I do not understand the entire problem, but at least enough of it, I'm going to start, like Mike suggested before, talking to vendors, talking to people, and, and trying to figure out what is out there and see who I feel comfortable with. Because sometimes, I mean, yeah, that may be the Cadillac, but you know what? The reps are kind of bad, and I can't trust them, and you know, I, I can't work with them. On the other hand, there is somebody else who is smaller, maybe cheaper, maybe doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but they really try hard and they really, I mean, support you and they really kind of partner and work with you very, very closely. So I have a better chance of success with them. I just need to get from point A to point B. You know, we have heard that also, and we did this on an episode, I remember, with Aaron Peck, the CISO of uh, Shutterfly, talking about the eagerness to work with startups because they're so eager to prove themselves that you can get such unbelievably good service from startups. Have you had that experience your own? Absolutely. I'm serving on several startup advisory boards exactly because of that reason, because I'm looking for people who can help us solve problems. They don't want to develop in a vacuum. We have true problems we need to solve and they're eager to solve it for us. So it's a win-win for both. There's got to be a better way to handle this. Brian Fanny of Orbita asks, vendor scope can change over time within a project or the start of another and harder to control than the initial evaluations. I want to stress on that. And initial evaluations obviously don't show the full scope. Anyways, Brian goes on to say, they start off when non-critical requirements slash needs eventually grow into handling assets of greater value and or gaining access to more critical systems. So I'm going to start with you, Mike, and Brian ends his question here with, how do you keep up with vendor slash project scope creep from the security sidelines? Because, you know, the project's dealing with it. Now you also have to deal with it. Ultimately, the key is to not sit on the sidelines. You engage the team from the beginning, document the requirements and the associated security requirements as well. So you've got project requirements, security requirements associated with those. And make an agreement with the team that when the scope changes, that they need to re-engage. And generally, they're going to do that. You know, they're not trying to work against you. If you've got that agreement and then you stay engaged, check in with the project. Don't just wait for them to come to you. 
if you can kind of look at this and go, hey, this is probably going to be a big deal, um, check in with them on a periodic basis. Don't just wait for them to come back to you six months later and say, hey, we're ready to go live. And then you've got no idea what, what they're shipping. So stay involved along the way. Have that close relationship and stay off the sidelines so that you're not surprised. And it also helps that team out. There have been many projects that have been thrown for a significant loop because they're ready to go live. They take it to the security team for a, a final review. The security team says, hey, everything has changed. We can't approve this. And now the whole project is blocked. Have that relationship along the way. And with that team being involved, the likelihood of a last minute block dramatically decreases they're happy, you're happy, everyone's engaged. Would you say, by the way, project creep, especially when you're at the sort of the evaluation stage, you know, all these things that, that uh, Brian mentions here, especially like connecting to critical systems, it's like project creep seems inevitable, yes? Rarely do you know exactly what it is that you want to do with something new. I love the Mike Tyson saying of, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. You don't really know how this is going to play out at the very beginning. You can't say that there's going to be no creep. So it's it's inevitable. Your own, it is inevitable. Yes. And how do you deal with it? Yeah, I agree. It's inevitable. I think especially like, you know, when you have a large organization and there are so many development teams running around and doing different things. Um, I mean, just just know you can keep up with everything. And I, I think, you know, I don't think it's also realistic to expect that all business decisions will flow to like one security team. It just never happens. And the security teams often lacks the context, right? I mean, and, and to become very quickly familiar with exactly what a business is trying to do and why and, and do it at scale over and over and over again, it's it's very, very difficult. And then that's why security becomes the backlog and the bottleneck and Everybody like hates security because like, oh my God, it's the security guys again. They are blocking me from moving to production. It's just the day before I need to go live, right? So I, I think, you know, a better way is to handle that is to really the security team need to educate and the security team needs to empower and provide the tools and capabilities to those who are closer to the project to make those decisions. But also, you know, like Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. You know, those who are closer to decisions and making those decisions needs to be held accountable. There is need to be a governance structure in place to allow that, but have this more of a symbiotic relationships, kind of more of a yin and yang approach to it, as opposed to, no, it's like one toll gate and you have to pass through the toll gate before you can actually go to the next level. I think having those closer relationships, like Mike described, and being there, being with the team, working with the team, I think that's what will make it much, much better. I want to reference something you said, and actually something that's going to be on Defense in Depth this Thursday. We were talking about building a security team and, and one person said, well, one of the first people I'm going to hire is like a communications marketing person to communicate to the people because I think security is a people problem about security here. And you talked about when you were a child, you were getting your security muscle trained when you were a child. So would part of having people cope with project creep better just be sort of an ongoing communications discussion about I guess, security implications and things to look out for your own? Absolutely. It's education about risk management. And by and large, a lot of people, most people don't know how to do risk management. They will tell you like, I don't like any risk. Well, we do risk management all the time. The way you're waking up in the morning or you go to bed or take a first step and you're doing risk management, even if you don't know it. So I think, yes, we need to focus on educating and making people more comfortable understanding what are the risks? What are the threats? What are the implications? How to deal with them? Um, that's the only way we can scale that. I mean, otherwise, we just will never keep up. Are there? I'm going to throw last to you, Mike. Any sort of additional tips on sort of how you sort of prep the, I guess, the non-security audience for as this project creep happens, more security issues come up, and here's how to kind of prepare for that? Or do you just like deal with it as it happens? It's a combination of sometimes you do just have to be reactionary, but you can give them guidance that, you know, if you cross this line or if the data changes, basically there's a few bright lines that you can give them to say, if these change, come to us. But that's still only going to catch 75% of it. 
some of it you still have to be reactionary, and and that's part of the having those check ins uh, on a regular basis. But if you give them some bright lines, uh, they'll they'll follow up with you. Excellent. Well, that is a good point to conclude our show today. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Yaron. And thank you to our sponsor, StackRox. Thank you very much. A brand new sponsor of us. And we're thrilled to have them on board. Thanks very much. All right. Yaron, I let you have the very last word here. But first, Mike, any last comments to our regular guests that we adore, Yaron Levy? <laughs> Yaron, uh, thank you for joining us again. It's always a pleasure when somebody comes back and joins us and we can have a follow-up conversation. What I really liked, one of the things you kept saying over and over again was pushing the decisions closer to the edge and talking about how that uh, helps with scale. And, and that's something that's very clear and very near and dear to you. And so thank you for sharing that concept uh, and reminding folks about that. But I wanted to specifically go back to your point about the GoDaddy fish and really what you're talking about was building vigilance through education rather than building it through gotcha. That's a good reminder to folks as well. So thank you specifically for that reminder of how to actually build vigilance. But in general, just that the whole idea of really reminding people how to think about decision making and, and security. So thank you for sharing that with your audience and, and thank you for joining us. All right. Your own. Any last comments? David, thank you, Mike. Always a pleasure, I mean, to, to come to the show. I'm a big fan of the show, avid listener from the very beginning. Thank you. Both, I mean, you know, Defense in Depth and um, Vendor Relationship Podcast. I mean, I love this show. Have you listened to the news one, the headlines? <laughs> sure. I have, not frequent enough, but I have. That's on my <laughs> Friday morning. So thank you. I really appreciate that being on the show. Uh, I love to, to be here. Yes, I'm uh, uh, just going to thank you for, you know, we're end of 2020. Thank God. Yes. Well, this is coming out in 2021, but we're recording this at the second to last day of 2020. Yeah, so um, I, I really want to recognize a lot of people that uh, came together and supported each other throughout the security community. And it makes a big difference for a lot, a lot of people with this crazy year. So part of what you guys are doing, part of you know what other teams are doing, thank you for that, keeping us sane and healthy. That's important. So thank you. Well, thank you, your own. Thank you, Stack Rocks. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, audience. We appreciate everything you do for us in terms of all your awesome contributions and your listening as well. So keep it up. And thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.